This evening, our scripture is Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is about the relationship between the psalmist and God. Biblical scholars tell us that this psalm is a song of trust in the midst of crisis and that it's actually the crisis itself that causes the psalmist to cry cry out in trust as opposed to anger or frustration or fear. Psalm 23 doesn't name a specific crisis, but instead it reminds us of the relationship between God and God's people and about the beauty of living life in the here and now, even in the midst of the usual troubles and sorrows and struggles that accompany us throughout our lives. The scripture we're about to hear read is different than the translation of Psalm 23 we are accustomed to, which is what? The King James Version, right? Yes, it is the gold standard of Psalm 23, and it truly is. We hear uh, Psalm 23, King James, in, in nearly every funeral or memorial service that we're a part of, and certainly it's used in other places as well, but that's one place that we hear it. And and one of the reasons it is always the King James Version, along with the fact that it is extraordinarily beautiful, is that it is familiar. And there is comfort in the familiar. But this isn't a funeral. (laughs) It's not my job to make you comfortable right now. So I don't want you to be offended that when we hear Psalm 23, it isn't the King James Version. And the reason for that, partially, is that when we are so familiar with the scripture, it becomes a kind of sing-song. It's really hard to listen to it, word for word for word, because we know it, and we're sort of anticipating the next verse. And so, as we listen to Psalm 23 from the Message Bible, I would ask you to try not to critique or compare to King James Version as you're listening, but instead do your best to just appreciate and receive this version. You may remain seated as you listen for the word of God. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bonnie. So when you think of the word home, H-O-M-E, home, when you think of home, what comes to mind? We have different ages and stages in this space, and I like that. And, And it's certainly not a trick question, and there's absolutely no wrong answers to any of this. There'll be as many responses as there are human beings in this space. So when you think of home, what comes to mind? Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's where you live now. Maybe it's the neighborhood that you're in. Maybe it's the town that you're in. Maybe that's how you see home. Or as an adult, it may be a place, but maybe it's the house you grew up in. Maybe it's the neighborhood you grew up in. Maybe it's the town you grew up in. When you think of home, what comes to mind? Is it, is it a person or maybe a group of people? Is it, is it family? For some of us, it's family. Is it dear friends, people I refer to as family you choose? Could be. When you think of home, what comes to mind? See, for you, maybe it's, 
Maybe it's more internal than external. You know, maybe it's more of a feeling. You know, it's an awareness. It's a, it's a fullness or it's, a, it's an ache or maybe it's both at the same time. There's a wide variety of ways to understand or define the word home, and there's no right or wrong to any of it. It's personal. It's personal. And home, we know, home can be a loaded word uh, with enormous expectations attached to it that are sometimes met during our lifetime and sometimes are not. Home aligns with a wide array of perspectives. And I want to share a story with you to just help identify a particular angle. It's not right or wrong, but just a particular angle. So if you've been up here much at all, you know that I grew up in Iowa. My, my parents were high school sweethearts from Grand Island, Nebraska, and every summer we took a trip from, from Ames, Iowa to Grand Island, Nebraska in the family station wagon. That was just something that happened every summer. Almost all the extended family was there. Grandparents were there. Aunts and uncles were there. Cousins were there. It was a lot of fun to be able to go. But the summer leading into my sixth grade year, the summer between fifth and sixth grade, something really weird happened in my family. Really weird. We were only a couple of weeks out of school and into the summer, fully assuming we would be going to Grand Island that summer. That really usually was our big vacation for the year, you know. And our parents pulled us aside and told us that um, this summer, Mom was going to go by herself to Grand Island. What? No! We all go to Grand Island every summer. We all do this. We look forward to it. That was just, what? Grandma, Mom's going to, to Grandma and Grandpa's and see everybody just by herself? I, that didn't make any sense to me. So we, my brother and I were asking a lot of questions. And there, no, there was nothing wrong. Just mom was going to go by herself. But see, in all the times we'd driven to Grand Island during the summer, my dad did all the driving. I'd never seen my mom drive on the highway, even once. I wasn't sure she knew the way. And I thought, how is she going to get there? And then my parents said, well, mom will ride the bus. You know, the only bus I knew at that time was the school bus. So then I was really confused. None of this was making sense. They wouldn't tell us kind of the reason why. They seemed pretty calm about it and stuff, you know. So I was playing with my friends, like probably that same day or the next day in the, in the neighborhood, and I said something about this, you know. And right away, one of my friends said, oh, maybe somebody's sick. Is your grandma sick? Is your grandpa sick? And I oh, my gosh. So I went home. I thought, that must be it. Is grandma sick? Is grandpa? No, nobody's sick. Your mom's just going to go to Grand Island on her own, and nobody would tell us why. So we three kids were going to be at home alone for a week with Dad, which actually was awesome because he was the fun parent, you know? <laughs> he was. I mean, he had a great sense of humor. He was super loving. He, he would make us pancakes in the shape of our initials. I mean, the man knew how to have a good time. And I don't remember if he took vacation or if he just did his work from home or a little of both, but I will tell you that that week, I really don't remember anything. So it's just like nothing significant really happened. It was fine. So the week went by. Mom had been gone for a week. The week went by, and it was the day that we were going to pick up Mom at the bus station. And you better believe, my dad had us up early, and we were cleaning, and he wanted to see what we were going to wear, and he wanted to make sure our teeth were brushed and our hair looked good and all that kind of stuff. It was going to be just perfect when my mom got home, right? And so we were getting close to the time where we would need to get into the station wagon and go pick her up, and there was a call from, I don't know, I guess the bus depot or the bus company, and everything was okay, but the bus that my mom was riding in on broke down by the side of the road about 20 miles out of Ames. And by the time they would get another bus out there and switch all the luggage out and do all of that, it was going to be about a two-hour delay. Well, my dad would have none of that, right? So he, he just like threw us in the station wagon, and we went. We went to find the bus 20 miles outside of Ames. We got there, and Dad pulled over to the side. He got out of the car, told us to stay put. You know, 
He walked up to the bus. The, you know, the door opened. My dad disappeared into the bus. Next thing I knew, my dad was coming out of the bus. The bus driver was behind him, and they were going to the side of the bus, you know, where they lift up and they, they stow all the luggage. And I'm telling you, I don't know if my mom was saying goodbye to everybody or what, but it took her a while, and finally, she stepped off the bus. And it is a memory that is just burned in. I will never forget it. She stepped off the bus. She was wearing, I can tell you what she was wearing. She was wearing a new dress. I hadn't seen it before. It was a summer dress. It was brown with white polka dots, and on her, it looked extraordinary. My mom was really pretty anyway. She was wearing her hair different, you know? Something about her just looked different. I remember thinking, geez, she looks younger. You know, I thought about this. She was probably all a 32 at the time. But, you know, I mean, she seemed old to me. It's like she looked younger, you know? She looked, she looked beautiful. And I, was, and I was watching her, and I realized, oh, she's smiling. My mom had a beautiful smile, and we hardly ever saw it. And it was like her whole face was lit up. I think following a week away <laughs> from cleaning and cooking and laundry and child care and dad's just unbelievable snoring, you know, <laughs> my mom was rested and refreshed and loved, and it was like she bloomed while she was away. Well... Yeah, she was home. I think an experience of home in which she felt cared for. And knowing my grandma Ruth, she waited on my, hand, my mom hand and foot and enjoyed it, and my mom would not have denied her that pleasure for a moment. And you know what? I think we all need, we all need experiences of home in which we know we are loved and cared for. And I think so often as adults, home, you know, whether we are living with others or living on our own, is a place in which we carry a massive amount of responsibility. I mean, we know we're blessed to have homes and all that we have, but there's the, the, the house or the condo and the upkeep and the maintenance and the cleaning and the laundry and the bills and the yard. And there are, you know, cars to maintain. And there may be people to take care of. There may be kids. There may be elderly parents who need our help. There may be pets. Sometimes we just want to pack a bag and get away to Grand Island and go home to Grandma Ruth for a week and just be waited on a little bit. Not just catered to. You know, catered to is something we can buy when we go on vacation, and that's nice too, but this is different. Home as cared for from a place of love. And it won't come as any surprise, you know, that this, that this transformation in my mom it only lasted so long, right? I mean, in some way, we all need rest and refreshment and love even just a little bit every day. And the thing is, you know, we, we can't always get that from our family and our friends. And I think that's where God comes in. And I want you to listen to this scripture again with all of that in mind. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through the death valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. We are all of us. Every one of us, we are all children of God at home in this world here and now. 
And I would encourage us to think of Psalm 23 as scripture for now, for today, for every day, as we move through our lives in this world. That last verse, your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. See, and that's including right now. Right now, in this moment, in this world. But you might be thinking, really? How? How? When I was in seminary, Eden Seminary, I had a professor of Christian education, Karen Ty, who's since retired. But she talked about how we, as human beings, are made up of body, mind, and spirit. And she compared body, mind, and spirit like three gears, you know, with cogs that have to work together. And she would talk about if one of those gears was even a little out of alignment, it affects the rest. So we know how to take care of our bodies. And like, whether we do or not, that's another thing. But we know, don't we? We know what we need to do. And we know that our bodies need to be used. And we know that our bodies need to move. And we know that our bodies need exercise. And we know what that means. But what about our minds? Well, you know what? Our minds need to be used, and our minds need to be exercised. And, and we do that through, through classes, and through reading, and through learning, and for reaching out, and in conversations, and being open to new ideas, and it's wonderful. But see, the same thing goes for our spirits. Our spirits need to be used. Our spirits need to be exercised. Well, how do we do that? with spiritual disciplines, with spiritual practices, with something John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, referred to as means of grace. For many of us, this is the gear that might be a little wonky. This is the gear, not for all of us, but for some of us, this is the gear in which, you know, how do you exercise your spirit? What would be example of spiritual exercises. I have, I looked as I was doing this sermon, I have about a dozen books on my shelf having to do with spiritual exercises, spiritual practices. And they, there's hundreds of them, really. But there's some main ones. And just for example, Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, lists these 12. Meditation, prayer, fasting, study, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, you're doing worship, worship, guidance, and celebration. When we learn, when we have the courage to, when we make an effort to engage in spiritual practices, in spiritual exercises, in means of grace, and we do it regularly, that one kind of wonky gear starts to run a little more smoothly. And when it does, and it's in sync with the other two, the kind of amazing thing is this. Scripture, like Psalm 23, can become the rest and refreshment and love our spirit is seeking in the here and now. And as children of God, wherever we may be, we are home. Thanks be to God. Amen.